Okay, so thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we integrate engineering into physiology and uh, basic science instruction uh, using the bioengineering curriculum at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign as an example. And so I want to take you through an example of a cardiovascular module that we've developed and, uh, and really show you how you can integrate uh, an engineering treatment of these uh, concepts uh, into your coursework without really adding additional uh, engineering content uh, to the course. So a uh, traditional physiology uh, textbook is filled with uh, a lot of qualitative information about how a system works. And so I show an example here of, uh, of the left ventricle and the systemic artery, blood being pumped out into the systemic artery and stretching, uh, stretching it and creating uh, arterial pressure uh, and going through the heart cycle as that blood then leaks out through the systemic circulation. Uh, and, uh, and the pressure comes back down, uh, the arterial pressure. Uh, so uh, this is a very qualitative relationship in the textbook. It's a cartoon drawing. Uh, this is a common textbook used for physiology. It's Byrne and Levy. Uh, but really, this, this figure captures the basic principles and the basic cardiac cycle. Uh, but it doesn't really give students uh, a, a quantitative understanding of how the system works. So they're left to rely on memorization of the concepts and trying to understand how the system works. Engineering students, however, already know a great deal about conservation of mass and flow and differential equations. And so we really wanted to take advantage of that and reformulate the way a lot of the traditional physiology is delivered by taking advantage of that background. Um, so we're going to provide the mathematical relationships to the students in a very simple form, uh, enabling them to simulate the relationships, uh, look at the quantitative aspects of it, do prediction, uh, and really create this enduring understanding of the content uh, that they don't have to go back and just simply rely on memorization. So our goal is really not adding engineering content to physiology uh, for the students to understand, but our goal is to use that engineering background to enable them to better understand the physiology uh, in a more efficient manner, in a more quantitative manner, and, and really getting an understanding that allows them to use that to design new systems uh, and to model other systems that they may not have directly uh, addressed. So we're really integrating with that student's previous quantitative training and providing the material in that framework. We're not trying to add uh, additional concepts from engineering to it. So I'm going to go through this example, and I think you'll get a good feel for how that's done, uh, and so in, a, in an ideal case. Uh, so this is the systemic arterial model. This is what was in that Burn and Levy figure that I just had up. Uh, and we're going to go through an animation first to kind of make sure that everybody understands what the system we're simulating is and how it works. And then I'll show you how we model it. And actually, the animations here uh, actually take longer than understanding uh, the, the quantitative modeling of the system. So this is our cartoon of how the system works. I have a, uh, a heart, a left ventricle here that has blood in it. It's going to pump it out into a systemic artery. Uh, that systemic artery is going to stretch and generate some blood pressure that's going to be measured by a blood pressure cuff here. Uh, and then as that blood flows through, it's going to leak out into the rest of the systemic circulation, uh, really a largely a resistive flow network. So we're going to go through and animate this. So uh, I also have a curve down here called blood flow. As the heart starts to contract, the left ventricle starts to contract, we're going to push blood uh, out uh, into the systemic artery. So we have some blood flow here. Uh, that's going to cause the systemic artery to stretch as it fills in. So we're going to get that artery filled in. It's going to stretch, and it's going to generate blood pressure uh, and that, uh, that we can measure with our blood pressure cuff. And then as it flows through, it's going to start leaking out into the systemic circulation. And that's going to largely be a steady flow for us. Uh, the pulsatility of the flow through the uh, systemic artery is largely damped. And we'll see how that happens. It's going to come naturally out of the system that we model. So the blood pressure goes back down here, and that was one cycle uh, for the heart. And we had our blood ejected from the heart uh, and flowing through the, systemic, uh, flowing through the systemic circulation here, too. So we can go through an additional cycle where uh, the, the systemic artery is stretched again, uh, blood flows through, and leaks out through the systemic circulation. All right. So that's largely the, uh, the process we're going to simulate here. Uh, the way we're going to do it is we, we really don't need too many uh, concepts from our engineering courses here. Uh, so we're going to really focus on one property uh, of the systemic artery, and that is compliance. Uh, and that property is going to drive our simulation. Uh, so compliance is a change in volume over change in pressure. Uh, so that's shown uh, here. 
Uh, and so you can think about this uh, in terms of a balloon. Uh, if I have a, uh, a large, very compliant balloon, so a large compliance, then a small change in pressure uh, from blowing in is going gonna, is gonna to create a very large change in volume. Uh, so that would be very compliant. Uh, so uh, our systemic artery is our balloon in this case, and we're going to be putting blood pressure in, and we're going to see how much change in volume uh, we get with that. The change in volume is really going to be driven by how much blood comes out from the, from the left ventricle in each, in each uh, uh, heartbeat. So that's the stroke volume. Uh, and then minus how much leaks out through the systemic circulation. So that's really what's going to be driving this model is that change in volume. It's going to cause changes in pressure. And our goal with this model is to watch changes in systemic arterial pressure uh, throughout the heart cycle. And then also see how it changes as a function of compliance of the, of the arteries. So we take this expression and we uh, simply uh, turn it into this one. We're multiplying by delta P. And so now we have the compliance times the change in pressure is equal to the change in volume. And this is going to be the usable version of this. Now we need to actually define some of these things. As I mentioned, the change in volume is going to be driven by the stroke volume out from the heart uh, minus the flow through the systemic circulation. So we're going to go ahead and write that out here. Change in volume is the flow through the aortic valve. Aortic valve is between the left ventricle and the systemic artery. So this is the amount of flow flowing into the systemic artery. And then we're going to subtract off how much leaks out through the systemic uh, circulation. That's all the arterioles and capillaries in the rest of the body uh, that are consuming that blood supply coming from the artery. So we have this change in volume, the flow into the systemic artery minus the flow out of the systemic artery. Uh, and then we have, go back to our original equation. Uh, the C times delta P is equal to the flow in minus the flow out. One more relationship we need before we have our full model here. And that is that the flow through the systemic circulation is really going to be a resistive flow. So we have a, a pressure, uh, and that pressure is going to be across a resistance. The resistance is the arterioles and the capillaries in the systemic circulation. Uh, and so that's going to determine what the flow is. This is just Ohm's law. Uh, engineering students have seen this in lots of different contexts, uh, but this is really just a resistive flow. So for the, for the systemic flow, we can plug in this value too. And if we do that, we end up with our final expression for our simulation, which is shown here that the compliance times the change in pressure is equal to uh, the flow. This is the change in volume uh, function now. That's the flow out of the uh, left ventricle uh, minus the resistive flow through the systemic uh, circulation. OK? Now, this is a, a valid expression. But for the engineering student, we're going to turn that into a differential equation. The change in pressure and the change in volume are time functions. As the heart beats, it's, it's ejecting a stroke volume. And that's the time function of the change in volume. So we're going to turn this change in pressure into a, a time function here, a time derivative. Uh, and then pressure is a function of time, and the flow out of the heart is a function of time. But this is a differential equation. This is describing uh, the systemic arterial model, how pressure is developed as flow comes out from the heart, how it depends on compliance and peripheral resistance. And this is the equation that we're going to use to drive our simulations. So let me show you what that simulation looks like. Uh, it's, it's quantitative, and so we necessarily need some parameters to define how the system's going to work. What's the heart cycle? What's the stroke volume? Uh, how fast is that blood uh, ejected from the heart? And so to do that, we have to define a couple of parameters here. So the duration of the heartbeat, uh, this is going to give us the uh, heart rate in minutes. Uh, the stroke volume is going to be in, uh, give us how much uh, volume is ejected in each heartbeat. And then we come up with a... Uh, a waveform that tells us about uh, how that, how that, exactly how that stroke uh, volume looks as it's ejected from the heart, what velocity. Uh, we're just approximating it as triangles here uh, for now. Okay, and then we need our two main parameters that are really driving the relationship between that change in volume and change in pressure. Uh, we need our compliance of our systemic artery, uh, which we set to a value. Notice this has units. Everything has units. It's quantitative. That's one of the aspects of this Simulation-based approach is that everything has units. You figure out, how do I measure this? Uh, what does it mean in, in, in actual measurements? Uh, and then we have our systemic resistance here, okay, which also has units. Okay, so a couple of parameters have to be set up in order to get our simulation to run. Uh, but then our simulation model is really easy. So uh, in, in our bioengineering curriculum, we use Simulink. Uh, and Simulink is in a, a program called MATLAB, which we have uh, a license for students to get free access here on campus. Um, this is a simple first-order differential equation. This is the computer code that runs the simulation. It's a graphical uh, way to solve differential equations. And this is the entire code for the simulation. So we have, uh, we, all we have to do is we have to find, uh, calculate what the derivative here is in this expression. And I've reordered our previous expression so that it 
Um, it, it tells us exactly what that derivative is equal to. I basically divide it by the compliance here on both sides. Uh, and then once I have solved for this derivative, I just send it through an integrator and out the other side I get the, the, the pressure, what we're trying to estimate. So if you look at this expression, I need to, in order to calculate this derivative here, I need to take the flow in from the heart. I need to subtract the pressure over the resistance. This is the pressure divided by the resistance. I subtract that here. And then I need to divide the whole thing by 1 over, or multiply by 1 over CSA. And then I get this, this expression. I integrate it, and I go back around. So this is the simulation. It helps us solve uh, for the pressure as a function of time. Uh, we just simply have to put in what the stroke volumes look like in this case. Here's what the result looks like after that simulation. Uh, at the top, I have flows coming uh, through different parts of the system. I have uh, in blue is the uh, flow through the aortic valve. And so we can see the pulsatile nature of that. With each heartbeat, we're getting a, a stroke volume out if you were to integrate the area under this triangle. Then we have the systemic flow in red here, which is more of a stable uh, function. It's, it's damped oscillations, and it's fairly stable across. Uh, uh, the pulsatility has been dampened out. Uh, and then this bottom plot shows the pressure in the systemic artery over time. Now my model takes a little while to fill up that systemic artery, kind of like what we saw when we were looking at the animation. We have to fill up that vessel before it can generate pressure. Uh, but then over time with each heartbeat, we're getting a systolic and a diastolic pressure as we go through, as we eject that stroke volume. And you could line these figures up exactly, zoom in, and see how does that pressure increase uh, in relation to the, to the volume being ejected from the heart. Okay, so this is the full model for the systemic artery. It's a very simple model, but we can learn a lot from this model. So I wanted to point out some of the questions that the student can answer pretty much on their own, playing around with this model, trying different parameters, and running lots of simulations in a very short amount of time. So some of the questions that students can answer is, what does the arterial press, pulse pressure look like over time? That's what we were solving for. We wanted to understand what does that pressure look like over time. Uh, how does it change with age-related changes in compliance of the arteries or even peripheral resistance? So we can change the values of compliance and see how the pressure goes. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, why is flow steady in the systemic circulation? Why is the pulsatility damped out in that systemic circulation? This model allows them to understand that from a quantitative perspective. Uh, what is my arterial appliance, compliance and peripheral resistance? I'll show you that in bioengineering, we actually send the students into the lab, make a few measurements, fit themselves to the model, and figure out what their own arterial compliance and peripheral resistance are. And what is the role of peripheral resistance and arterial compliance in, in generating mean pressure and pulse pressure uh, in the cardiovascular system? And so uh, it turns out that peripheral resistance is largely related to mean pressure, whereas compliance is related to pulse pressure. So understanding those concepts is an important aspect of, of understanding the cardiovascular system too. So I give you two examples of that here. Uh, so one of them is uh, how looking at the decreasing compliance uh, of the systemic arteries as you get older. Uh, so we can run a simulation. This is the simulation we had before. This is our compliance value. Uh, and notice the units again. It's very quantitative. Uh, if we then uh, drop the compliance, compliance decreases as a function of age, uh, then we can actually see here uh, that the pulse pressure has increased here. Uh, the mean pressure uh, has changed a little bit. You can see that the mean pressure is slightly higher here than it was before, uh, but uh, the pulse pressure is quite a bit larger uh, than, than it was before. So uh, you can get a good feel for how that compliance changes the pulse pressure waveform. I also mentioned that in bioengineering, we can send students into the lab. Uh, they hook themselves up to uh, some uh, biopack unit, they make a measurement of their heart rate, their blood pressure, and then they go back and they fit their peripheral resistance and arterial compliance to the model so that they can determine what their measures are. These are things that you couldn't actually measure uh, uh, non-invasively uh, on students uh, in a lab setting, and so it's really interesting that they can make these measurements that they wouldn't have been able to get access to without the model. And then we have them do something to try to manipulate those measurements and then make a change and see if they can make, uh, if they can uh, measure the change. So for example, exercise um, will reduce uh, peripheral resistance, especially if you can get the exercise going to a certain state. And so we have them exercise uh, and then see if they can measure a change in peripheral resistance, or if when they go back and fit the model, if it looks like arterial compliance change. If it looks like arterial compliance change, it's really interesting because it means they didn't fit the, uh, they didn't fit the assumptions in the model. Uh, that they didn't exercise long enough, they really just increased venous return uh, in order to get the, uh, the increase in flow. 
Okay, so uh, there's a lot of benefits to this quantitative approach. Uh, the students coming out of this, uh, this short exercise would uh, have a good uh, understanding of arterial compliance resistance, pulse pressure, uh, stroke volume, and the units associated with those. Uh, they'll be able to use those relationships for predicting uh, behavior in a variety of different conditions when some of the parameters change. Uh, they, uh, they know how to extract parameters. They understand the units of the measurements and the variables. And they really get a feel for the dynamics of the system. So it really pushes for a, a quantitative understanding of these relationships instead of the, the memorization. It gives them an ability to do this hands-on experimentation to really get that understanding uh, in, ingrained in their, uh, in their physiological workflow here. Uh, so, uh, also you can take a lot of these models, another benefit is you can take a lot of these models and you can extend them uh, to do similar things. Uh, there's a lot of components in the body where you have flow, pressure, and compliance. Uh, and so for the respiratory tract, for instance, you might be able to do some of the same modeling uh, exactly. The units are different, the names of structures are different, but the student can understand and ex extrapolate this approach to that uh, physiological system. Okay. So uh, I want to show you, though, this is a very simple model. This was just a systemic artery. So I want to give you some insight into uh, expanding this out to a full cardiovascular physiology section. And so lots of interesting things happen. The, the blood pressure is not primarily driven uh, just by the stroke volume uh, of the left ventricle. The stroke volume from the left ventricle is driven by compliance changes in the left ventricle as the heart contracts. And so we can incorporate that into the model fairly simply, too. And so a small extension of this model we can look at two compartments. We have the left ventricle and the systemic artery. And so we have some equations here, uh, differential equations related to the left ventricle and the systemic artery. Notice that this equation looks very similar to the equation we just had for the systemic artery, except that uh, we have a second resistive system here and we have this S variable. The S variables are uh, indicating opening and closing of valves in the system. Uh, so uh, SAO, for example, here's the aortic valve. If it equals one, the valve is open. If it equals zero, the valve is closed. So you don't allow flow if a valve is closed, and you do allow flow if a valve is open. That could be relaxed if you had uh, an incompetent valve. You could actually model that here where you could allow some flow. Maybe, uh, maybe it has a different resistance in the forward versus the, the reverse flow case, uh, and you could incorporate that here. Uh, we also have resistive flows across everything here. So we have a resistive flow across the aortic valve. So the left uh, across the mitral valve, we have the left atrium to the left ventricle flows through the mitral valve, and we have a resistive flow there. Uh, we have a resistive flow across the aortic valve uh, that's going, this is the left ventricle volume, so it's leaving the left ventricle, but it's entering the systemic artery. This is a systemic artery volume equation. And then we have flow out through the systemic circulation, which is exactly the equation we had before. So we've, we've taken some of the concepts from that first model, we've added valves, and now we have, uh, instead of having a stroke volume from the heart driving this, it's actually the compliance of the left ventricle. This is going to be a function of time. As the heart contracts, the compliance changes, and we'll see that in the next slide. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the output of the model. So this is the compliance uh, change and the pressure. Uh, the compliance change in the left ventricle is driving this model, so students can understand how that compliance to the left ventricle changes uh, in systole and diastole. So during systole, that compliance is going to get small as the heart muscle contracts. And then during diastole, as the heart relaxes, the compliance comes back up so it can accommodate a large volume at a low pressure again. Uh, if we run the simulation, we get two pressure waveforms now. We get the pressure in the left ventricle, which is shown in blue, and we get the pressure in the systemic artery, uh, which is shown in green here. Uh, and you can see that they actually, they go together when the aortic valve is open, which connects the two. Uh, they're, they're, they go together, and when the aortic valve closes, the left ventricle pressure relaxes as the compliance increases uh, back in the, uh, in the left ventricle. Uh, and then the systemic artery holds that pressure as it has a constant compliance. It holds that pressure, uh, and it slowly leaks out through uh, the systemic resistance uh, during the rest of the heart cycle. We can look at flow rates in different parts of the system. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, the three different flows that we have to worry about now. We have a flow through the mitral valve to refill the left ventricle. We have a flow through the aortic valve out into the systemic artery, uh, which is the stroke volume. And you can see that in green here. It's very peaked as the heart contracts. Uh, and then we have the systemic circulation in red, which is still this damped uh, function here, which is almost non-pulsatile, but still has a little bit of pulsatility left in it. So we can look at the flows, we can integrate the flows over our heart cycle and understand that the flow through each element of the system is the same. 
And so that's a good concept for students to understand uh, too. So that there's no accumulation of volume in this model. We need the flow going through the mitral valve to equal the flow going through the aortic uh, in the steady state. We also get a couple of other things for free out of this model. Uh, we have a pressure volume curve for the left ventricle. And so this is the heart work, uh, the work cycle for the heart, the left ventricle. Uh, this is a, a, a very difficult concept for students to understand. But in this mode, uh, the ch compliance changes in the left ventricle are driving the model. And so students can understand this very easily and understand what the pressures are here uh, when the, uh, and look at the places where, for example, the aortic valve is open, where both valves are closed, and, uh, and when the mitral valve is open. So we also have the pressure volume uh, loop for the systemic artery, which is a linear relationship. It doesn't change over the heart cycle, so it ends up as just a straight line. We can simulate pathology. Uh, so uh, if you have uh, one of the valves has a, a narrowing, uh, you might get some higher resistance through that valve. Uh, and we can actually simulate that, so an aortic valve stenosis. We get a mismatch between the pressure in the left ventricle and the systemic artery, even when the aortic valve is open. And so we get plots like this. So the left ventricle pressure is in blue here, and it actually spikes up uh, as the systemic arterial pressure is raised uh, to get the flow. Uh, and so you can see this mismatch here, which uh, is an interesting thing to understand. Why does that pressure differential exist? How big can it be? How does it depend on the resistance of, of the aortic uh, valve? We could take this a step further uh, in the bioengineering curriculum. We then take these models of these systems and then we, we teach other aspects of engineering uh, and, and innovation to go on the back end of this. And so we teach uh, controls through uh, trying to develop controllers to, uh, to modulate the physiological behavior of these systems. So for example, a hypertensive patient uh, might be simulated on, uh, on a device, and we'll show you the device here in a second. Um, we might have a hypertensive patient, they have too high a blood pressure, we're going to develop some experimental drug uh, that is similar to a beta blocker, it's going to reduce the contractility of the heart, we're going to apply it via an infusion pump, there's a lot of kinetics and dynamics associated with that delivery, uh, and the students will design a controller deciding how much drug to give, they quickly understand if they give too much drug the patient dies, there's no way to ungive the drug, and so it's a really interesting problem, it has a great deal of realism to it, and they can really see how uh, they can manipulate these physiological systems then too. And where can you intervene? What are the requirements? What are the risks? Uh, what are the design choices that have to be made in a physiological system? So this is a, a look at what we do. We design our hypertensive patient on, uh, on, a, on an Arduino board. Uh, it's running a simulation uh, and outputting a, a blood pressure through one of these wires here. Uh, it outputs a blood pressure. The blood pressure is too high. Uh, and the, the students design a controller and turn it in on this Arduino uh, that decides from that pressure how much drug to give. Uh, they've identified the system, they've modeled the system, they've uh, looked at this, it's a nonlinear system, to try to figure out what type of controller they can design to control this. They give a drug signal back and that modulates the behavior of the patient. And you get plots like this. This is the pulse pressure, so for this particular project we wanted to uh, we worried about the pulse pressure, and we wanted to control the pulse pressure to 40 millimeters mercury. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the model, the simulation uh, has to tune up again. It has to reach a steady state, but then we have a hypertensive patient here with a high arterial, or a high pulse pressure. Uh, we decide to give drug. It brings the pulse pressure back down uh, to where we want, but then over time the drug washes away or gets metabolized, and we need to give some more drug uh, in order to keep it at that level. We can also control mean arterial pressure. Uh, so here we wanted to control mean arterial pressure to 100. So this very similar situation where the, the patient is hypertensive initially, we give some drug and it actually brings it back down. Okay? Uh, we feel like this is an excellent way to teach physiology, a very important way for future clinicians to understand physiology. The role of models in medicine is on, a, on the rise. Uh, and so I'm going to give you a specific example of that, uh, looking at the artificial pancreas. So over the last... Uh, 20 years, uh, people have been working uh, really hard on, on modeling artificial pancreas for diabetes and looking at insulin delivery. Uh, and so this has really made a large impact on, on medicine. Uh, showing, I show a simple model here. If we have a, a simulation for a subject, we can actually work on designing insulin pumps, controllers, how do you deliver, the, what, what's the schedule for delivering insulin, how do you decide, and then even working on glucose sensors. How should they react? How can you filter that? What types of variations do you expect to get from a real subject? And so using a simulation, we can actually simulate across all, all types of people across the whole population. We can get a large variety of things that we test our controllers against. 
we can run those very quick uh, in order to determine how well they're going to act across a range of subjects. So uh, we have some simulation of a subject. We can put some sensor model in, some controller, and decide how to deliver uh, insulin uh, in these cases. Uh, and we can get a very accurate representation of what's going to happen across the population. So it, it, this has come so far that in 2008, the FDA approved the artificial pancreas uh, as, a, as a model for testing for, as part of the IDE process. Uh, it replaced animal uh, testing, uh, so on dogs. And the, the statements that have been made are that, the, uh, that this in silico model, the simulation model, can capture the variation across the population and gets more realistic behaviors than looking at the uh, analysis of this model on, on, on a dog, uh, which is what was being used before. The artificial pancreas model has 13 differential equations and 26 parameters, uh, and, and it's really eliminated animal trials, which are expensive and timely. Uh, are, are time, they cost a lot in money and time as people are developing their device, uh, and so they've largely been replaced uh, by this simulation model. And we've seen a lot of innovation be driven by this because the barrier now to try things out has dropped. Other companies can enter the race. You can try more algorithms, and you can go for more approval of different uh, devices. So hopefully that gave you a good overview of how we can integrate engineering into the curriculum without adding a great deal of extra information that's just focused on engineering. We can use the student's background in quantitative metrics uh, in order to be able to help them very quickly understand how a new system is working. We can draw relationships across uh, systems that share some common features such as compliance, flow, resistance. Uh, and through this we can enable them then to extend that knowledge to other domains. So for example, uh, designing controllers, predicting responses, designing devices that can then be used to modulate that physiology. So we really feel like this is an excellent way to address physio uh, physiological information, basic sciences, uh, and hope that we'll be able to see this uh, type of material really develop here uh, over the next few years as we go into this new college of medicine. So thank you very much for your attention.